are transforming the planet. Correction, we are designing the planet. For millennia, human beings have been designing ecosystems to maximize resources for human beings. Take the English countryside here. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's green, it's got hedges, rolling fields. People travel from all over the world to come and visit the English countryside. A few years ago, one of my colleagues here in Plymouth, I heard him referring to the English countryside to students as a factory. And I thought that was really interesting. It really stuck with me because it was a really interesting way of looking at it. I presume, I think, that most people probably look at this environment and they think it's a beautiful landscape. It's a place to go and actually enjoy nature. But it's designed for crop production. And I wouldn't necessarily call it a factory myself. I personally would prefer to refer to it as a cultural landscape, one that has been shaped by both humans and nature. Next week, a moment is going to happen, probably on Monday. The human population is going to reach 7.6 billion people. There are so many people on Earth, and our impact on the environment is so great that geologists are now talking about calling this era, this geological epoch, the Anthropocene. Anthropo referring to us, humans. And we're not evenly distributed. We tend to like living in cities, like Hong Kong here. And we particularly like living in coastal regions. Right now, 40% of us live within 100 kilometers of a coastline. By 2050, we're expecting this number to increase to 50% of 9.8 billion people. Now, you guys can do the maths. That's a lot of people living in a really small area. And of course, this is going to have dramatic consequences for vulnerable coastal ecosystems. These burgeoning human populations, and of course, let's not forget climate change, sea level rise and rising um, storm frequency, we're seeing lots and lots more scenes like this. Very large coastal defense schemes being designed to protect people and property. This is expensive business, not just financially, but also environmentally as well. We are replacing our natural habitats, our beaches, our rocky shores, our mangroves, our salt marshes, we're replacing them with hard engineered structures like the seawall and the rock armor that you see in this image here. There is increasing impetus for us to now make these kind of structures to serve multiple purposes, not just for humans. All of these hard rocks, if you place them in the marine environment, they will become colonized by marine life, whether you like it or not. Everything represents habitat for something. And you've all heard the phrase, build it and they will come, right? But how you build it determines who and what will come. Now, I work in a, a, a research area called ecological engineering, or eco-engineering for short. And the definition of this is the design of sustainable ecosystems that integrate human society with its natural environment for the benefit of both. Now, even if you've not actually heard the term, I'm sure you're all well aware of the actual concept. Many of you, I'm sure, enjoy green spaces, parks, and conservation zones in cities. We all recognize that these green spaces are vital for human well-being, and we increasingly recognize this. But of course, they're vital for habitat, for, for um, wildlife as well. Let's take our English countryside. Those hedges are not just important for defining the boundaries of fields. They're also really important habitat and corridors that enable wildlife to travel in safety. But how do we do this in the sea? I work in the marine environment, and it's a much newer field in the sea. We haven't been working on it anywhere near as long as we have on land. Let's take the seawall on the left-hand side. It's been built for human purposes. It's been built to retain land and to protect from coastal protection. Clearly, it's carrying out its primary function at serving us as humans, but it's not really giving anything back to nature. Yes, there are some seaweeds on here, some hardy species, but there's very little else living on there. It's practically devoid of life. And the reason for this is it's a very simple environment. It's lacking all the all-important complexity. The natural analogue to a rocky shore, to a seawall, is a rocky shore. And I'm sure many of you have rock pooled as kids, maybe you still rock pool today. 
and you know that there are lots of weird and wonderful creatures that live on rocky shores, and there are lots of them. Rocky shores are very diverse environments. But most rocky shores are very complex. They're physically complex. They have rock pools, they have boulders, they have overhangs, they have channels, they have all sorts of areas for marine life to live. And it's this physical complexity that's essential for the diversity of marine life. So back to our seawall. How can we improve this environment to make it better for marine life? Well, this is a really active area of research now, and one that myself and my colleagues here in Plymouth um, have been doing a lot of work in for, for quite a few years now. And people all over the world are doing some really great research designing novel um, ways of enhancing the diversity, the, the life, on these artificial environments. There are even companies cropping up all over the place that actually design products that can help do this as well. So depending on what councils will allow us to do, we can, let's take a scenario, we can actually work with the seawall itself. If we were allowed to, we could actually drill directly into that seawall. We could actually drill the pits and crevices and the complexity straight onto the seawall. We could go to one of these companies and we could get artificial rock pools and we can stick them to the seawalls. Some companies even design these large fascia, so you can actually front the seawall with this large, complex environment. And sometimes they're even made of special concrete. That's actually beneficial for marine life and has a lower pH, it has a, 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 a less of a carbon impact. All of this is good stuff, but that's if we go directly onto the seawall. What if we weren't allowed to work on the seawall? Well, there's lots of options available there as well. We can easily place boulders in front of the seawall. We can actually drill directly into these boulders. We can create artificial rock pools. We can create pits and crevices directly into the boulders themselves. Or we could actually replace the boulders with large habitat enhancement units like our bio block that we have here. All of this is going towards increasing complexity, physical complexity. And if you increase physical complexity, you will increase diversity of life. But how do you eco-engineer a situation like this? I'm sure many of you recognize this as the Palms in Dubai. It is the largest artificial island in the world. Fantastic engineering feat. It has a very large footprint, and I'm sure you can imagine anything, the natural habitat that was underneath that footprint as it was constructed, be it coral, sand, rock, seagrass, that has long since disappeared. Clearly, this is a very extreme example, but not a unique one. If you go home and Google artificial island, I promise you, you'll be surprised at how many there are. And they are on the increase, particularly in places like Asia and the Middle East. This is a major concern, but this is not something that we can hide from. It is something that we have to face head on. While I personally am against this kind of mega development from an environmental perspective, I'm also acutely aware that in the very short space of time that I'm speaking to you tonight, probably an extra 2,000 people have been added to the planet. Development, whether we like it or not, is inevitable, particularly in the short term. But what can we do about it? Well, there are ways that we can deal with this. We can make space for nature in these human-dominated environments. The first thing we can do is avoid developing on what I'm referring to as green and blue spaces. The green refers to on land, the blue refers to in the sea. These are spaces that have never been developed previously. Okay, we haven't constructed on them before. We need to do everything in our power to protect the green and the blue. No matter how barren this habitat or this environment or landscape appears to be, we need to protect it. It is precious. No amount of eco-engineering can give back that 500-year-old coral reef or that virgin rainforest if we develop on it. If development has to go ahead, and I think it's safe to say that it will in places, we need to actively encourage that it happens in the grey and the brown. These are areas that have already been degraded by human beings. The grey refers to urban landscapes, um, like cities, for example, and the brown refers to landscapes that have been developed, but have actually been abandoned, okay? And sometimes they might be contaminated land. It is the gray and the brown, that's where you get the winds, okay? We call this win-win ecology, 
Okay, that's actually the science, making space for nature in human-dominated environments. If we look at it from our own perspective, we're probably going to go ahead and develop anyway, so we're going to win no matter what in the short term. But if we think about it from a biological perspective, from an environmental perspective, this is where the winds are, in the grey and the brown. Okay? Nature will lose out in the grey and the blue for sure. The title of my talk was, How do we make space for nature in the Anthropocene? I think the answer isn't just, is, sorry, is there space for nature in the Anthropocene? I don't think the answer is just yes. The answer is there has to be. We must consider nature. We must consider how we can make space for nature in this human-dominated environment. Otherwise, all we're going to leave behind for future generations is a lot of grey and a lot of brown. Thank you.